Copper mining and refining in Zambia. Copper production is the single all important mainstay of Zambia's economy. It provides about 95% of the gross national income and that will be maintained for a considerable time ahead. The mines and refining facility are located in the Copper Belt, the northward extension of a vast mineralized zone, sometimes called the RAND, extending from South Africa all the way into the Congo. As to be expected, the exploitation of the various minerals is, is concentrated along the zone with the best deposits. Large-scale mining has started after World War I. The location of the major mines and the refinery is indicated on this map. Four of the mines are the vast open pit types, five others the deep rock type. The quality of the copper deposit is remarkably high, about 2% or so per ton. By comparison, open pit mines in Arizona work deposits with about 1% ore content. The original owners and operators of the mines was the vast Anglo-American corporation owned by Western capitalists. In the early 1970s, President Kaunda of Zambia has decided that 51% of the shares in the Zambian operation should be owned by the state paid for in time from the high profits. The order led to remarkable problems and by the mid-1980s Zambia has acquired a national debt of some $8 billion leading to the eventual deposition of Kaunda, who was always presented by the one-party system and the press as the father of the nation. An open pit mine is a vast undertaking, worked with very heavy equipment and spread out over 20 acres. The workable depths may extend to 1,000 feet or more. The actual limit decided by the groundwater level in the pit, causing problems with the excavation and the cost of transport. As a rule, it is operated 24 hours through the year, unless a major problem causes temporary halt. A major task is presented by the need to find appropriate areas to unload the overburden, that is the surface material of dirt, rock, etc., to reach the layer containing the copper ore. In the background of this scene, you see the huge pile of tailings, the proper name for the overburden. In Zambia, the heavy seasonal rains will leach out various chemicals from the tailings, creating a type of environment where plants will not grow, a type of man-made desert, but that is ignored as proper rehabilitation would involve tremendous costs and reduce profits. The illustration shows a 100-ton truck used to carry the overburden for dumping at the tailing site. When Kaunda decided to get 51% of the mining shares, the managerial technical personnel near entirely South Africans decided to upgrade the transport to 200-ton trucks. All those had to be bought at a very high cost from South Africa. Consequently, the profit for Zambian government has declined greatly. The South Africans also decided that a considerable part of the refinery equipment also needed replacement and Zambia had to agree to the inflated cost to keep the operation going. Remarkably, some 15 years after independence, Zambia did not have a single qualified mining engineer. The Africans entering the university would consider it below their status and dignity to work in an occupation 
where the environment was hot and rather dirty and going underground where the black miners worked was simply no-no. The massive tall structure shown here is housing the hoisting equipment for the lift serving the underground mine. The workers and the rare visitor will enter a heavy wire cage accommodated some 60 persons. On the order of the mine captain, the cage is lowered at a very high speed to several hundred feet or so to the work surface underground. No person can enter or leave the works without permission by the mine captain, a white South African. The discipline is tight to avoid any chance for an accident. Underground, the African workers handle modern equipment to drill and blast the ore surface. Altogether, some 30,000 African miners were employed in the copper belt in 1972. It was a very desirable work with high wages, up-to-date standards and the added benefit of living in communities provided by the mines in small but decent housing by African standards. The mines had a close control over all activities including sport facilities, while drunkenness and undesirable behavior was polished to a remarkable extent. Underground mining requires specialized equipment, the mechanical shovels having low profiles and engines able to handle the constantly wet conditions. Though all the underground mines are pumped constantly by huge pumps, there is no way to get rid of all the water. As the illustration shows, with hard rock mining, there may be no need for very expensive shoring up the tunnels by timber. Overall, the engineers have to be very highly qualified and South Africans have gained experience in working deep diamond and golden mines are the best available. Working in tight and often not very well lit places would cause claustrophobia for the average person. The constantly damp setting is rather uncomfortable and may be one of the reasons for the total absence of graduate African mining engineers on their ground. On the surface level, there is very considerable dirt, dust, high noise from the heavy equipment, and in any enclosed place and buildings, temperatures may range up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit and over, especially in the casting halls and refinery. In the copper mines and refinery, operating 24 hours year-round, a person must develop and maintain the appropriate attitude to accept and maintain the required standards. The scene shown is that of the all-important refinery, as the copper bars sold must have a purity of 99.9% to be used by the various industries. In the photo here, the buildings are somewhat obscured by the smoke from several large stacks, as concern for environmental pollution is not a major issue in industrial installations in tropical Africa. The goal is to maximize profits. Health hazards also get minimal considerations, while all operations have particulate emissions which are definitely harmful to some degree. That explains why I am wearing a mask on a tour of the refinery, while most African workers do not wear one for whatever reason. The huge rotating drum here, one of the several, is used to grind up the ore before loading into the reverberatory furnace for smelting. Hardened steel balls are used to break up the rock and the noise of the process is remarkable.
The sketch of the furnace is illustrated here, and while the drawing is neat and clear, in reality, the massive size of the installation, the noise, dirt, smoke, and heat has to be seen for proper appreciation. The drawing of the slag is especially impressive as the molten material shoots out under pressure from the air blown in. The men attending have to wear special fire-resistant clothing, which will increase the temperature inside the suit to 120 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Practical experience has shown that for whatever reason, the process of smelting is improved by feeding entire logs into the furnace at a specific rate. Of course, each time the door is opened for that purpose, large amounts of heat is radiated outside, but that has to be accepted as necessary. The illustration shows the log being fed into the furnace. All logs are hardwoods, and the mine maintains a logging operation to assure a steady supply. The workers employed on the smelting floor are all Africans, the white supervisor monitoring the process from platforms and through sophisticated equipment. As mentioned before, the smelting is continuous process and handling it without interruption requires very specific skills all around. The molten copper is poured into huge containers in preparation to be transferred to the molds used for casting. The temperature of the molten copper is over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit and the heat, smoke, etc. makes a reasonable imitation of hell as projected by the preachers of the true believers. But those who actually work at the process are proud to be participant to such impressive operations and the African employees enjoy a very considerable prestige among the population in general. In the continuous casting process, the copper is poured into forms on a rotating wheel, the timing set to get a specific amount into each form. The operators have to keep away due to the very high heat but carefully monitoring the pouring. The equipment is very costly and is specially designed to withstand the wear and tear for continuous reliable operation. The close-up shows the molten copper flowing into the mold. This type of mold is used to cast anode plates which later will be transported to very large electrolytic cells for further refining to the required 99.9% .9 purity. The amount of electricity required for the overall operation of the refinery is very high, provided by a 300,000 volt transmission line from Zimbabwe and also from the Kariba Dam. In this scene, one can grasp the huge scale of the operation, a vast hull used to deposit the anode plates for further refining. The operation has to be designed to accommodate the anodes delivered from the continuous casting process and then further smelted to be cast into the finished ingots. In the final casting process, the molds are shaped to produce the wire bars, that is the heavy ingots each weighing 600 pounds of highly refined copper, the standard item used in the international trade. The weight of the bars is remarkably uniform, the cast amount controlled by elaborate equipment. After cooling for considerable time, the wire bars are examined very closely and any visible defects or inclusions of some impurity is removed by chisels, grinders and other means. 
This process is carefully monitored as on the international market the price of the finished product is sold in a competitive setting. The finished bars are loaded for transportation to Dar es Salaam on the coast. Before the building of the rail connection from Zambia to the port, the copper was transported by heavy trucks, facing a difficult travel as they had to descend and then ascend the Great Rift Valley on a rather poor road. On the return trip, the usual load was oil in barrels, but by the 1990s there was a small pipeline to take care of the supply. The scene shows one of the several mining townships established by the mines for the African workers. In general, the workers are accommodated by tribal groups, and while the scene is very different from the traditional rural setting, the good pay and abilities provided secure a reliable working force. As to be expected, the South African managerial and technical personnel, about 3,000, are housed in a different setting with spacious large homes, gardens and often even a swimming pool. With all the pompous talk about independence, the economy of Zambia depends near entirely on the copper mining complex controlled by foreign capital management and technical personnel. That is unlikely to change significantly for a very long time while the economic, political and social conditions have to accept the necessary accommodations to that reality.